I received some criticism in a previous video for saying the Mac felt a bit out of place in Apple's product lineup, since it was created before the mobile device era and didn't feature an Apple-designed chipset. And while that may sound like an unfair statement, consider the experience that an iPhone or iPad delivers. Users can run the same apps on both devices, they can expect all-day battery life, an instant on-display, silent operation, and no overheating issues. But Intel-based MacBooks don't offer any of that. They have a completely different operating system architecture that can't run iPhone or iPad apps, real-world battery life always falls short of Apple's estimates, especially for performance-intensive tasks. Displays aren't instant on, operation can get quite loud due to fan noise, which is triggered because the processor is running too hot. So it isn't hard to imagine that users might be a little disappointed with the MacBook experience compared to the iPad or iPhone. And Apple knows that. In fact, they've been aware of the glaring differences since the original iPad in 2010. During a meeting about the MacBook's future roadmap, Steve Jobs brought his iPad and demonstrated its instant on display compared to the MacBook's less responsive display. He simply said, see this, I want that to do this. And the only way to get the MacBook to have the same responsiveness as the iPad was to build a custom chipset. And that's exactly what Apple did with their new M1 chip. So in this video, I'll explain why the transition from Intel to M1 is so important and why it took Apple so long to do. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to help decide which topics I cover, make sure you're subscribed, and voting polls like this one will show up in your mobile activity feed. Alright, so why is the M1 chip so important? Well, first is the improved user experience it brings to the Mac. As I mentioned, MacBooks weren't behaving like an iPad or iPhone, which is what most users had come to expect from Apple products. But with M1, that's finally changed. Apps launch almost instantly, just like iOS devices. Your MacBook's display turns on the moment you wake it up, just like iOS devices. The battery lasts a full day without having to recharge, just like iOS devices. Users can enjoy a completely silent experience with the MacBook Air since it no longer needs a fan, just like iOS devices. And M1 Max can run iPhone and iPad apps natively, which makes for a seamless experience between devices. But that's just the beginning. The M1 chip also offers a level of performance never seen before on a notebook. Compared to the previous generation MacBook Air, the new M1 model is faster in every category. It's 3.9 times faster at transcoding video in Final Cut, 3.6 times faster in Xcode, and 2.3 times faster at exporting images in Lightroom. In fact, according to its Geekbench scores, the M1 MacBook Air outperforms the 16-inch MacBook Pro featuring Intel's Core i9 processor. That's a $1,000 ultra-portable notebook, outperforming a $2,700 high-performance notebook. And if that isn't shocking enough, consider that the M1 chip is delivering that higher performance while using less battery, which is something referred to as performance per watt. And it's by no means a new concept. Steve Jobs actually discussed it at Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference in 2005 when announcing the transition from PowerPC to Intel. Here's what he said. Just as important as performance is power consumption. And the way we look at it is performance per watt. For one watt of power, how much performance do you get? And when we look at the future roadmaps projected out mid-2006 and beyond, what we see is the PowerPC gives us sort of 15 units of performance per watt, but the Intel roadmap in the future gives us 70. And so this tells us what we have to do. So Intel chips delivered about five times better performance per watt than PowerPC, and this was especially important for notebooks, which could run faster and cooler, feature more compact designs, and have longer battery life. But there was another benefit of Intel chips, and it was their more predictable release schedule. Near the end of the 90s, manufacturing issues began to plague the power PC, with IBM frequently delaying new chip releases that Apple was counting on for their upcoming products. 
So as you can see, the type of technology a company decides to use is extremely important. That's why I chose Squarespace to build my Apple Explained website. The technology they offer is unmatched by any other website building tool. Squarespace automatically optimizes your website for mobile devices, so you don't have to waste time creating a desktop and mobile version of your site. They have built-in analytics tools that report page views, traffic sources, time on site, most read content, and more. You can create an exclusive paid membership area just like on YouTube, and you can even create an entire e-commerce store to sell physical or digital items. I actually did that a couple years ago to sell merch, and it was way easier than I imagined. Also, if you Google Apple Explained right now, my website is one of the first results. That's because Squarespace has the best search engine optimization tools that make your website more visible to more people. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Apple Explained to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All right, now if you consider what's happening with Intel today, the problems they're facing are very similar to those that plagued the power PC. The latest Intel chips have experienced multiple delays, their performance hasn't been as good as many expected, and they've actually caused overheating issues on products like the MacBook Air. So it's no wonder that Apple was eager to transition their computers to a new chip yet again, except this time it would be their own custom designed ARM chips, which provide three times better performance per watt, faster processing power, and even faster graphics. But perhaps the most impressive and underrated things about the transition from Intel to M1 isn't the speed improvements or longer battery life, but app compatibility. One of the riskiest parts of transitioning from Intel's x86 architecture is losing support for Mac applications that have yet to be natively written for ARM. In fact, Microsoft suffered from this exact problem when introducing their ARM-based Windows RT operating system. The platform was never large enough to attract many native developers, and traditional Windows 8 applications weren't compatible, so customers were forced to compromise when buying devices like the Microsoft Surface since it didn't have have a large app ecosystem. Apple, though, is in a more advantageous position. They already have a huge base of developers creating ARM apps for the iPhone and iPad, so transitioning the Mac to ARM will guarantee an even larger app ecosystem than exists for it today. But what about all the previous x86 applications that users still need to use on their M1 Macs? Well, Apple actually solved that issue by creating Rosetta 2, which translates x86 apps and allows them to run on ARM. But there are some limitations. The translation process takes time, so launching these apps would take longer and run slower than a native ARM equivalent, although many tests have found that these emulated apps are still running faster on M1 than they had on Intel processors. But perhaps the most important thing to recognize is that the M1 chip is a first-generation product. Just like the S1 created for the original Apple Watch, this will be the slowest, worst-performing chip of its kind, which is pretty mind-blowing since it's already outperforming the most powerful Intel chips. And consider what this means about the Mac's release schedule. People have always asked me why the Mac isn't updated on a regular basis like the iPhone, iPad, and Apple Watch. And it's mainly due to the unpredictable schedule and delays of Intel's chips. So with M1, we should begin to see regular updates to the Mac, and perhaps even more dramatic redesign refreshes than ever before, since Apple's custom silicon has proven to advance more rapidly year after year compared to Intel. Now, the last big reason why the M1 chip is so important has everything to do with PCs. Throughout Apple's modern history, they've struggled to capture even 15% of the US PC market. While the iPhone sits at 45%, the Apple Watch at 55%, and iPad at 64% market share. But with these new M1 Macs, that may start to change. After all, the number one reason why customers choose PCs over Mac is their lower price. In 2019, the average PC customer spent $700 on their notebook, so it's understandable that the $1,000 MacBook Air would be out of their budget. But consider the new pricing strategy Apple is taking with the M1 model. Their retail price is still $1,000, and the education price is still $900, but for the first time, they're offering an $800 model for schools and universities with half the storage space. 
Now, customers can't access this model today, but I wouldn't be surprised if Apple lowers the price of the MacBook Air by $100 when a new model is announced. It wouldn't be unprecedented since they just dropped the Mac Mini's price by $100, and they have offered a $900 retail MacBook Air before. So if you consider its potential affordability, plus its unbelievable performance, it would be really difficult to justify purchasing a PC notebook in the MacBook Air's price range. And I think that's exactly the strategy Apple is preparing, and it just might result in the Mac becoming more popular than ever before. Alright guys, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to help decide which topics I cover, and I'll see you in the next video.